Good afternoon, friends. I would request the panelists to please come on stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Aid Society of India and uh, CNS uh, News uh, team welcomes you to this afternoon session, uh, press conference on people living with HIV but dying of NCDs. And uh, this session is also going to be uh, live cast and live streamed by the organizers also. I am Ishdeep Kohli from uh, Jodhpur School of Public Health in India and also part of the CNS team here. Rollout of antiretroviral therapy and other health services should allow every person living with HIV live a normal, healthy lifespan. But are the gains made in HIV care threatened by non-communicable diseases? NCDs such as cardiovascular disease, cancers, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, mental health, Alzheimer among others, cause over 70% of deaths worldwide. This session aims to examine and present how NCDs impact people living with HIV and possible best practices in synergies or lack of between AIDS and NCDs program. We'll start the session with uh, uh, Dr. Rishi Sethi. He is a professor, cardiology department, King George Medical University, India, an executive council member, Cardiological Society of India, and member of Scientific Committee, Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology. He'll be giving, he'll be speaking through uh, video conferencing. Thank you. Eminent members of the panel, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure to interact with all of you from thousands of miles away. The city where I stay and work in is called as Lucknow. It is around 500 miles southeast of New Delhi, the capital of India. The beautiful building that you see in front of you is the medical university I work in. King George's Medical University, and I am working there as a professor in the Department of Cardiology. We all know that non-communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases, are today the number one global killers. And when this epidemic of cardiovascular diseases and non-communicable diseases is also adversely affected by another epidemic of communicable diseases, for example, the HIV epidemic, uh, then probably the combination of two causes much, much more havoc on humanity than both of them individually. Well, today I would restrict my conversations and non-communicable diseases to cardiovascular diseases, which is my area of speciality. And I would like to give you all a brief overview of the clinical interaction between HIV and cardiovascular systems and how they both uh, synergistically add more, uh, more sufferings to our patients in modern times. So HIV has the potential to adversely affect cardiovascular diseases in all spectrum of cardiovascular diseases, the most common of which is coronary artery disease, myocardial infarctions, acute coronary syndrome, which are clearly the number one global killers as of now. HIV also inf uh, involves the myocardium and the pericardium, that is the muscle and the covering of the heart, causing myocardial dysfunctions, cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, as well as pericarditis and pericardial effusions. It is also responsible for some cases of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, HIV has got a strange interaction with the electrical system of the heart also and atrial fibrillation tends to happen more frequently with HIV infection and the management also is, uh, is a little controversial here. And then both HIV and cardiovascular system, uh, cardiovascular diseases, sorry, um, have got their own individual treatments but when we treat 
uh, each other uh, in in combination then probably we have to remember a certain kind of interactions of both these medications and how we should use them judiciously when both of them are present in one patient. Well, the spectrum of coronary artery disease in a HIV patient, if you take an example of North America, around 15% of deaths in a HIV population happen because of cardiovascular diseases, mainly coronary artery disease. Uh, the most common clinical presentation of coronary artery disease in a HIV patient is acute coronary syndrome. And the salient features here are that the mean age tend to be younger than those uh, as far as the acute coronary syndrome occurs is concerned as compared to those patients who do not have HIV infection. In these particular patients, HIV has been there for a pretty prolonged period of time, more than 8 to 10 years. Most of these patients are, are on antiretroviral therapies. Most of them are smokers and have some degree of dyslipidemia. Uh, sometimes we have seen that when patients are suffering from a communicable disease, then there tends to be more uh, tendency for the physicians to put them just on medical therapy and not offer them the surgical or the newer medical therapy advancements as far as invasive therapy is concerned. And here I would like to stress that the outcomes of both coronary angioplasty or it is known as the percutaneous coronary interventions as well as the coronary artery bypass surgery, the efficacy of both of them is similar in HIV population as compared to non-HIV population. So there should not be any, any bias as compared to treatment of HIV patients just on medical therapy. If we think that PCI and CABG are to be offered to the patient, we must offer them to the patient and they, uh, ha they end up have being equally beneficial in HIV population as compared to a non-HIV population. Uh, the ACS incidence is substantially high with HIV. Uh, recurrence uh, is substantially higher with HIV infection as compared to those patients who do not have HIV. Well, if you take a look at why HIV is adversely affecting coronary artery disease, if you just go into basics of pathophysiology, and I would just like to give you a very broad overview, HIV can influence the traditional coronary artery disease risk factors. For example, a smoker HIV has got 2.5 times more risk uh, of causing um, uh, uh, adverse outcomes in coronary artery disease as compared to um, uh, smoking in non-HIV patients. Hypertension tends to be more in patients on antiretroviral therapy and dyslipidemia therapy um, is also most of the statins are also to some degree are uh, having interaction with protease inhibitors with the exceptions of one or two statins about which we will tell you later. The, so the treatment of hypertension, dyslipidemia and uh, is difficult in patients with HIV and smoking causes more harm in a HIV population as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned as compared to a non-HIV patient. HIV per se is an inflammatory state and a procoagulant state. Both inflammation and pro and and coagulant state tends to tends to cause more plaque rupture and cause more acute coronary syndromes and myocardial infarctions. Immune activation is also one of the pathophysiology. Vascular endothelial dysfunction is also one of the features of HIV infections, and all these uh, in combination are a lethal for patients who already have some atherosclerosis. All these make the patients of atherosclerosis more, more prone to plaque rupture and more prone to acute coronary syndrome and myocardial infarction. It's also seen that when patients of coronary artery disease who are on antiretroviral therapy, if that antiretroviral therapy is disrupted or interrupted because of any reason whatsoever, the patient has an increased risk of having acute coronary syndrome and that is also one thing that need to be emphasized here. We also know that muscles of the heart, that is the myocardium, is affected by HIV virus and it has got multiple etiology. It is affected directly by HIV virus as well as other cardiotropic viruses are more likely to cause something called as the inflammation or the infection of heart muscles 
called as the myocarditis and symptomatic myocarditis or cardiomyopathy is known to occur in patients of HIV disease. Of course, illicit drug users, cardiac tumors and autonomic dysfunctions are also uh, agents which cause myocardial systolic dysfunctions in patients of HIV. Pericardial diseases, uh, pericardial effusion, pericarditis, uh, because of HIV infection as well as other opportunistic infections that, up, that happen in HIV uh, can cause both pericardial effusion and pericarditis and this is something also that we must know. Atrial fibrillation and flutter happen more frequently in patients of HIV and the role of anticoagulation which is very important in, um, in, uh, in patients of atrial fibrillation is really uncertain in patients of um, uh, HIV. There's no consensus whether it should be given or not, but there are many multivariate predictors of AF in HIV that is lower CD4 count, higher viral load, older age, uh, prior presence of coronary artery disease and congestive heart failures and renal failures, hypothyroidism and alcoholism, etc. Whenever we treat coronary artery disease or cardiovascular diseases, we tend to calculate uh, the risk factor for development of coronary artery disease. And it is seen that the HIV uh, causes, um, HIV causes around 1.4 to 1 or 2 times more, uh, it adds, it, it, uh, it multiplies the risk of coronary artery disease uh, in, in population by 1.4 to 2 times uh, the normal and if you take the average baseline risk of uh, coronary artery disease in the population that is infected with HIV and we multiply it by the additional HIV risk that imposes, we tend to have an overall risk of developing coronary artery disease in patients of HIV to around 23 to 35 percent over the next 10 years and that is equivalent to um, having, uh, uh, that is equivalent to actually diabetes. So HIV status, HIV positive status should be treated as a cardiovascular risk equivalent and should be all the risk factors in this particular um, scenario in patients. If the patient has hypertension, if the patient has dyslipidemia, it should be treated. If the patient has diabetes, additional diabetes, it, they should be treated much, much more rigorously in these patients if we want to uh, prevent an adverse cardiovascular. The statin use, a word is required here um, because most of the statins ad uh, interact with uh, the antiretrovirus therapy by having a common pathway of cytochrome P450 system. Um, the two examples, the two exceptions here are pitavastatin and rosuvastatin. So these statins appear to be safer in patients uh, who are suffering from HIV and should be the statins of choice whenever statins are to be given in such. So I would briefly like to summarize my presentation and my overview uh, is that HIV positive status is actually a coronary artery disease risk equivalent. Co-morbidities enhance the risk in many patients with HIV um, much much more um, as compared to patients who do not have HIV. Modifiable risk factors modification is an important role um, in any patient with cardiovascular disease, more so in the patients of HIV. Standard approaches to coronary artery disease risk reductions should be uh, offered to patients of HIV, especially uh, uh, the PCI and CABG. They should, we should not hold such therapies in patients who have HIV and atrial fibrillation is also emerging as one of the, the prominent threats in aging and younger populations of HIV. I um, thank you for your kind attention and I hope the symposium uh, adds more value in our, in, our, in our knowledge about treating this, um, this intersection between non-communicable disease and a communicable disease um, epidemic both in their own cells. So um, I thank you for your attention and hope you have a good day ahead. Thank you. Yeah. We uh, thank uh, Dr. Sethi and Bobby, thanks for the video presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Marike Windrocks. 
She is the Chief of Staff, Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, and she will give her thoughts on the NCDs and HIV together. Thank you very much. And I will very much focus at the way the Global Fund is uh, trying to at least contribute a little bit to NCDs. Uh, we also realize that as more people are having access to treatment or staying longer alive, that there are certain comorbidities that affect people living with HIV. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense to keep people on treatment and keep them um, alive when they are suffering from other diseases that might be fatal. And but we also realize that we are a global fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, source of resources are limited, so we have to prioritize what would be a role of the global fund in tackling NCDs. So we looked at data and, and also what an appropriate role could be because I'm uh, very much aware of the cardiovascular complications of uh, HIV infections, but the global fund, we're not the right funding agencies to start investing in big cardiovascular uh, programs. Um, so we really had to find a balance where it would make the most sense. So the areas that we thought in our context, low and middle income countries, where it would make mo the mo most sense is uh, cervical cancer, HPV. Uh, cervical cancer is one of the AIDS defining cancers. Um, women living with HIV, even if they're on treatment, they have five times higher risk of cervical cancer. And uh, the cancer tends to appear at much younger age than we normally see in HIV negative women. And the progress is much faster than we normally see. So this is absolutely um, an absolute no brainer that um, if you keep women alive uh, with HIV treatment, we should make cervical cancer screening and early treatment part and parcel of HIV programs. Another uh, area very obvious was hepatitis C, especially co-infection <coughs> people who inject drugs. Um, and also HIV uh, is uh, relevant as it can lead to chronic HIV infection, can lead to liver cancer. Um, so we have, and, and there's uh, in TB, there's uh, a relation between tuberculosis and diabetes. So we also are, so we also allow for some funding for di uh, diabetes control in part of TB programs. So it's very much the funding is available for countries to apply in the context of HIV or TB programs. Uh, a number of countries have taken advantage of this opportunity or sometimes when there were efficiencies to expand its uh, service in th these areas. But we also think it's uh, an area where there's still limited awareness. And a lot of countries, uh, people are not aware of the impact of NCDs and what could be done relatively simple. So also glad that we have this symposium. And I think we need to beat the drum that um, NCDs should be should be closer linkages to NCDs and HIV programs. Another contribution the Global Fund is making, which goes beyond the specifics of HIV and NCDs, is to support building the systems. Because at the end of the day, the people are accessing the same health system, whether they come for HIV treatment or for um, NCDs. So we, in the early years, some of the health systems funding might have been very sort of targeted to um, addressing concerns related to the HTB and malaria, but increasingly we are investing in system-wide develop with a strong focus on the primary level. And we're investing in things like monitoring evaluation and surveillance in strengthening the lab systems, in your own resources for health that really benefit the entire system, but ultimately will also benefit NCD. And maybe the most important contribution we are making is that we are lobbying very hard for domestic resource uh, modernization. Um, we know that uh, we've seen that a part of our allocation is contingent upon countries meeting co-financing requirements. We know that a lot of countries, um, first of all, they could increase the proportion of the budget they invest in health. A lot of countries dedicate only a small proportion of the budget on health. And countries can increase the overall envelope by, for example, more tax and revenue collection and including the tax uh, collection that would be good for the health budget it would be good for NCDs. Uh, so we were working with the World Bank, with IMF, and uh, trying to really, and, and with other key funders in the health sector, to really encourage countries to invest more domestic resources in health. Because I think at the end of the day, if you look at the NCD, NCD, NCD agenda, it really requires governments to step up to take responsibility, increase funding for health, and tackle NCDs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Marie Yeah for this enlightening talk and also interesting to know how Global Fund is also uh, 
promoting the linkages between NCDs and uh, HIV AIDS programs and how do we inform more linkages. I now call on Dr. Tripti Gilada. She is the Infectious Diseases and HIV Physician, Unison Medicare and Research Center India. Dr. Gilada. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, you know, I think I, it's, it's like a success that in, the, in this entire fight against HIV, we've reached a stage where we are actually thinking of beyond HIV and thinking about people living longer and what their problems could be. So um, as uh, our previous speaker said that this is like an intersection of two epidemics and we cannot fight one and neglect the other. Uh, I'm not sure, but there's a, if you've seen it, but there's a famous cartoon that's pretty popular in the medical community in India, which says, which, which shows a surgeon outside the operation theater saying that the surgery was successful, but the patient is dead. Mm. And you know, we, we don't want to be that bad doctor who's just thought about one disease without thinking if the patient is going to survive that surgery. So, um, and it has been shown that uh, HIV physicians are almost 60 times less likely to screen their patients for NCDs than, than other patients. So there is a, there's a big gap in the way we provide care. Uh, I think, I, I mean, it's true that we will need more funds, but compared to the other areas in HIV where, where it requires more uh, viral load testing or new ARTs, I think NCD is that one area which might be easier to tackle because it doesn't require that much of political win and that, and that many resources. We have the resources available to manage NCDs in most countries. It's just about increasing awareness. I think we as HIV mm -hmm. physicians aren't testing them or suspecting that our patients might be having something. And if you see the entire spectrum of diseases, the most common, common ones being cardiovascular, so hypertension, diabetes, and lipid uh, abnormalities, the investigations aren't expensive. They are easily available. You just need to check their weight, blood pressure, probably order lipids and sugars once a year, and boom, we'll pick them up. And once they're picked up, they can be managed. So the first thing is diagnosing our patients with NCDs. So increasing physician awareness, I think we need to talk about it more and more to the uh, doctors who are caring for these patients so that they start suspecting it and start screening the patients more. And the second important thing is integration of services. And we've seen this throughout the conference where patient-centric care and integration of services, it has been time, shown time and again that it's so important. Um, there was a modeling study that was shown in IS 2015 where they showed that a, a HIV positive patient in an ideal treatment scenario would probably live longer than an HIV negative patient. And that is our opportunity because these patients are already in care. You know, for HIV negative patient, they might come with a fatal event, but HIV positive patients are already in care and we really need to use that opportunity to at least tap the NCDs in this population. So I think if we really get our ideas around this and start talking about it more, we will be able to help these <clears throat> patients age with grace and age without a lot of mortality and morbidity with these NCDs. Thanks, uh, Dr. Tripti. On, uh, yeah, thank you for the talk on integration and patient-centric uh, services, which is the need of the day and call of the day. And uh, the next talk will be by Dr. Tara Singh Bab, Deputy Regional Director, Asia Pacific International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Diseases, the union, and part of the Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and NCDs Prevention. He'll be giving his uh, video message to us. Thank you. The session is uh, titled People Living with HIV but Dying of NCDs. It's an excellent topic that Soba and Bobby you have identified to discuss for this uh, very important session. NCDs are now the biggest cause of death worldwide. We know NCD kills more than 41 million people each year globally and it is uh, one of the major public health problem in low and middle income countries. Uh, only in ASEAN region, uh, the NCD kills more than 3 million people each year. 
and we also know the major NCD risk factors are tobacco use, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, harmful use of alcohol and air pollution. According to the WHO, up to 80% of heart disease, stroke and diabetes and over a third of cancer could be prevented by eliminating shared risk factors, mainly tobacco use, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity and harmful use of tobacco. Therefore, uh, uh, we really need to work together to find out the ways to, uh, to have a, a very coordinative, collaborative and integrative approach to combat NCD in people living with HIV. Uh, we have very good lessons learned from the HIV control programs where we have seen a very effective uh, teamwork, very effective uh, civil society engagements, mobilizations, media, uh, the uh, media, the engagements, and also we have seen very effective uh, the treatments, care and support. With these all the lessons, there is a good news that is people living with HIV can now have a, a very similar or very normal life expectancy. But the unhealthy, the, the environments and lifestyles and the behaviors such as tobacco use, harmful use of alcohol, unhealthy diet and physical inactivity threaten the un to undermine some of the gains that we have been made in HIV control and prevention. So we, it becoming a growing problem uh, in people with HIV. Tobacco smoking is one of the key drivers to increase the risk of death among people living with HIV. We have found the, the several evidence uh, that suggest people living with HIV are more susceptible to tobacco related diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer and other pulmonary diseases. We also noticed prevalence of tobacco smoking among people living with HIV is, is significantly high up to 70% in United States of America. And very similar figures was also found uh, in India among the men. Studies also suggest that HIV positive individuals face social stigma, mental and physical comorbidities, alcohol misuse and codependencies on other substances, all of which influence their tobacco use behavior. Therefore, we need uh, the intervention urgently. We need uh, a political and the social commitments. We need action on the ground. One of the interventions can be uh, the integration of the uh, HIV uh, and the NCD program in a regular pr primary health care services. This, <coughs> uh, the integration can be only uh, be possible if national governments, some national governments, civil society partners and the international community work together uh, to uh, uh, work together uh, on, the, on the ground. I would suggest uh, based on the lesson learned from the TV control programs regarding the integration of uh, the smoking cessation in DOTS program. The union, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, uh, in short, we call the union, has established a pilot program in some of the high burden countries, both in TB and tobacco, to see whether it's uh, uh, the feasible or not to integrate a uh, smoking cessation. From this intervention, we have found encouraging results. People with their TB who were smoker successfully quit. 
the quit rates were, was found more than 80% in Bangladesh and more than 60% in China, India, and Indonesia. The DOT provider, the health worker, only provides three to five minutes to counsel, to motivate the TB patients on smoking. And at the same time, they also pro provide the health information and the health communications to the patient on the regular TB treatments. Therefore, uh, uh, these lessons are, uh, the helps to really translate, to really replicate this, uh, the, the integration in other programs. For example, in this case, HIV and AIDS control program. So the, uh, the HIV the, uh, uh, and AIDS control program can uh, integrate the, uh, the non-communicable disease intervention starting from the tobacco cessation. Tobacco cessation and uh, smoking awareness program for people living with HIV can be integrated through primary healthcare services by providing the uh, brief advice uh, in, in, in a regular basis. It can be through uh, the one-to-one -one or it can be, uh, uh, can be through the, uh, the social media or any other types of media. And health workers need to be well trained and they need to be engaged uh, in, uh, uh, in, in providing the, uh, the health information on a regular basis to the, the people living with HIV. And HIV program can also include a regular screening for a high blood pressure, nutritional advice on how to reduce the salt and alcohol intake the measurement of blood sugar levels, checking liver and renal function at, at least once a year, and screening for cervical cancer. So these interventions are very cost effective and uh, can, be, can be done uh, at the primary care levels. But only thing that we need the, the uh, strong, uh, the, the, the support from the both national and subnational government. Therefore, uh, I would like to re-emphasize that local government's role is very critical. The local governments can provide the local solutions and the local governments can provide the better idea and they, they provide the local resources to identify the key area that can be a, uh, uh, implemented uh, in, in, in the local settings. The second issue I would like to highlight here is the engagement of the national governments in political decisions and in political actions in public health program. National governments should increase tax. National governments must ban the all types of advertising and promotional activities. National government should regulate the all uh, the, uh, uh, the product like for example, tobacco, alcohol, sugary, and sweetened beverage. In, and these all the, the products, uh, they should be uh, well regulated. In addition to that, the, the national government should frame the, uh, the, the NCDs and HIV under the umbrella of universal health coverage with plan and targets and all the plans and targets should be well costed and they should be time bound. The third, uh, the, uh, uh, but the, the, it's very important that the elements I would like to highlight here is family engagement. Family can play a, a greater role in, uh, in, in providing the better health services. Family can provide a, a, a role model to really motivate the, uh, uh, the to motivate the people for their own health, to counsel the people, to, to, to train the people within uh, in, in the household, to quit smoking, to quit alcohol, and to have a regular uh, the, the health checkup uh, on, uh, on a different area, as I mentioned earlier. So within the families, we have to also target the key, uh, the individuals, they might be the 
the mothers and other uh, uh, and other the, the people the, the other individual in the families mothers is is one of this, uh, the the uh, the key drivers and key motivators uh, in, in tb control program while we have in uh, the implemented the uh, smoking cessation and mothers play the greater roles to convince the uh, the, uh, the the smoker in the family to quit smoking therefore the, uh, in 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 uh, hiv context i would suggest we need to engage the family we need to engage the uh, local leaders they are mayors they are governors and also that the central government should play a critical role role to build the 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 uh, uh, motivations to build the, uh, the the support from the uh, national international partners and to offer the the best uh, the in, in uh, the solution uh, to to the people who need on the grounds with this i would like to thanks so the everyone uh, i'm very sorry i couldn't be there physically thank you thinking Thanks to Dr. Bam for his presentation and talk about uh, how the importance of tobacco control and uh, uh, connecting it, integrating it with HIV services. Our last speaker of the day is uh, Dr. Ishwar Galada, President AIDS Society of India, and he's part of the Governing Council member, International AIDS Society. Dr. Galada, uh, as people from medical community or science, we don't believe in God, but at the same time, we are every time reminded of our earlier learning when we were children. man proposes god disposes whenever new medicines come uh, and they are better than previous medicine we think that now everything is very easy very easy as the days pass we understand what is going to happen uh, one of my mentor used to say that god created melodies and remedies both at a time is a human being has to find out which melody work for which remedy or uh, which remedy will work for which melody so this kind of a cross puzzle we have to do life long now coming to uh, the role of physicians amongst most of the scientific professions medical profession is one profession they have to keep on learning learning relearning training now look at myself i am a basically dermatologist and venerologist coming into the field of hiv so my internal medicine is not that strong i i'm dermatologist and venerologist so i am looking at periphery of the body but when you come in hiv you have to learn all parts of the body you and then not only that today patients with hiv are living longer initially we used to tell them make a five year plan you are going to survive for five years whatever you want to achieve in five years you achieve now one zero is added to that 50 yeah. so there are people living for uh, at least in our practice 25 30 years with hiv they are looking at them they are going to live another 25 20 30 years and sometimes we tell them that don't worry you are going to live a perfect normal life another 20 30 years earlier they used to disbelieve me thinking that this doctor is not going to survive for another 25 30 years he is just saying that then <laughs> but actually it is really happening that is one issue and there are people who are aged and they are bringing hiv hmm. it is not that only people are growing with hiv there are grown up people 60 yeah. 65 70 being diagnosed for the first time and uh, it's not that they were suffering or they were harboring hiv for 20 30 years and now diagnosed they are bringing fr fresh so we as a uh, uh, caring uh, uh, caregiver as a doctor we have to look at both sets of people now uh, mm -hmm. there are a lot of uh, focus discussions here one treatment fit for all similarly here <coughs> those which are medical caregivers the one physician fit for all <laughs> we have to look at everything yeah. uh, there are a lot of targets given by unaids who some of the targets are sometimes we think that they are only dream targets but this one of the target is easier target as tupti said is a achievable target and one of the most easiest target to be achieved so uh, reducing 25% ncds it will not be a tough issue at all uh, there are certain things which are not a over stress they should be over stress in our practice when we uh, counsel patients uh, irrespective of whether they are going to have any problems or not ncd or not any uh, ill effect of medicines or not we tell them that you stop alcohol stop tobacco stop 
uh, smoking, uh, do exercise, do yoga, healthy living. What we are seeing, now I am practicing HIV for 34 years. And uh, my clinical setup, which is a comprehensive setup, is completing 25 years now. Which is comprehensive setup for counseling, testing, x-ray, sonography, all facilities under one door. So when we started telling patients, now what we see, a patient because he has, he has HIV, he has other multiple problems and taking treatment is surviving longer and there are other human beings accompanying him either as a spouse or a brother or a caregiver or a friend they, they, they are not caring for themselves mm. <clears throat> uh, they, uh, we always tell patients that you give an annual maintenance contract for your air conditioner mm. for your car not for your body mm. so when you grow old older than 50 60 already you are already on five six medicine every day and in addition to that if you get another problem you need to add so what we started seeing Husband, wife, husband positive, wife negative. Wife is dead, husband mm -hmm. is living. Two brothers coming. Uh, the brother who is HIV negative, he is dead. So our patients are surviving longer and with a better life, better quality of life than those who are, those who are not HIV positive. So to get a better quality of life, somebody has to acquire HIV. <laughs> that, that kind of situation has come. Yeah. Reverse, they say, no, it's a reverse. Second major issue is that there are guidelines and combinations of medicines they are changing more frequent than the seasons twice in a year thrice in a year and we do not expect that every doctor will update knowledge so often and will change practice uh, so fast so that they will be at, uh, at par with the world so we, we will be at some places uh, learning from our mistakes uh, for example uh, about two months before Two of our patients picked up diabetes. No family history of diabetes. They themselves were not diabetic. And we were surprised and not only diabetes, the blood sugar 600. So we started on uh, insulin and this and that. And then we realized we are doing some mistakes somewhere. So we picked up one by one drug and we realized that FTC or uh, emtisitabine may be a culprit. We changed MT uh, emtisitabine within two months, patient without anti diabetic treatment normal. Sometimes we may have lost that kind of patient in diabetic crisis. People may have filed uh, suits against us that this doctor has lost. But we are not cardiologists, we are not diabetologists, we are not uh, hypertension special, uh, specialists. We are uh, basically a general uh, duty doctors. In addition to that, we have some qualification in becoming HIV expert or STD expert. But in addition to that, those things we don't understand. And we have to keep on learning from our mistakes or from uh, the mistakes which can happen inadvertently without our knowledge. So therefore we cannot take that science has progressed very well and it, uh, all uh, discussion should end, all uh, research should end, everything we have conquered HIV, it is not going to happen. Whether HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, tomorrow hepatitis C completely, completely curable now, but maybe some problem will crop up after some time. So we need to watch out and uh, we need to learn and relearn Probably this kind of occasions of uh, IS2 to 2019 or IAC, they are the occasions where we interact with people, we try to learn uh, without confessing publicly, we understand that we have made a mistake there uh, and we should correct. Uh, that, that's uh, one of the things we are going to do. Uh, if you have any questions, please yeah. come back. Thanks, Dr. Gilada, for a very interesting talk. Yeah. Very interesting talk on uh, healthy living with HIV and uh, the floor is open for the audience for their questions. Yeah, please uh, state your name and uh, the question, please. We can start off. I can start off by asking, uh, you know, what is the way forward? You know, to all the speakers, how do we how we take it? We we all understand that it's it's not very difficult, but how do we make uh, the how do we change the health systems or how do we get the political commitment to go ahead? Uh, no, I think. Uh Political commitment or global fund commitment is on <laughs> one side, but when we are one to one with patient, mm -hmm. we need to understand what medicine will fit to that patient. Even if they say one medicine fit all, it is not going to be true. Whether it is dolutegravir or ifavirenz or ifavirenz 400 or new new drug coming gilfivirin or cabotegravir, not. So we need to decide what is fit to that patient <laughs> with a given guidelines. We are not going to reinvent the wheel, but given uh, 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 combinations available what medicines will fit to that particular person. And if they already have an underlying problem of cardiovascular disease or hypertension, we need to be doubly vigilant. 
Moreover, if they are already on some medication, we need to look at drug-drug interaction. Earlier, drug-drug interaction was very tough thing, but now there are formulas, there are uh, websites. You just put one medicine here and one medicine there. They show yeah. no interaction, <coughs> interaction, no interaction, partial interaction. So I think things have become easier with uh, uh, IT boom and a uh, lot of knowledge around. But uh, sometimes it, when it looks easy, it becomes tough also. Like at this age, I'm 62, <laughs> exposing. I have to uh, <laughs> learn a lot of, lot of jugglers, a lot of science uh, technologies, a lot of things. So uh, uh, thankfully, Trupti is on my right side always. So I, uh, rather than going on, online, I ask, what is a drug drug interaction with this? And she will tell me. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> Very good, yes. Dr. Marike, when Trupti No, I given. think you hit the nail on, on the head because I think it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's in each and every one of us. Mm. And I think especially for the medical professionals and then the policy makers uh, and, and the domestic resources, the, 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 the defendant that comes from the Ministry of Health. But it's exactly as you say, when mm. you're treating a person, you interact very regularly with the patient. So you look at the patient's health and it's actually quite a interesting observation that mm. you both do that people living with HIV live longer mm -hmm. because they are in regular interaction with the health yeah. sector. And so I think it's exactly as you say, it's it's mm -hmm. it's a no brainer. Like yeah. you're a doctor, you're trained to look at people, people and you have yeah. to look beyond your very mm. narrow field. Mm. Yes, thank you Doctor. Uh, Doctor Tripti. Yeah. Yes. So I think um, we all understand this, but when it goes when we need to implement this on a on the national scale, on a large scale, uh, we aren't probably some countries aren't giving that much importance yeah. to NCDs in their guidelines. Mm. And I think it is really high time that yeah. we really need to bring up NCDs higher up on the index list where we are thinking more about it. I think it's more, it's all about thinking and being aware that we really need to screen diseases, talk to our patients about habits and lifestyle modifications and do those quick, mm -hmm. uh, inexpe uh, inexpensive investigations. Yeah. Because sometimes you, you notice, you know, the countries, they have these uh, vertical programs, you know, the TB program is yes. separate, the HIV program is separate, yeah. sexual reproductive health yeah. is separate, and how do you form the linkage? You know, you know how, yeah. So how difficult it is to, when a person is ordering viral load, how mm -hmm. difficult it is to just write down yeah. another sugar and triglyceride? It's not that tough, or just check the blood pressure. Yeah. So it's, it's go, going back to training the physicians or just making, sensitizing them yeah. in, into doing it further. And probably bringing easy, easy, very, um, simple, easy to understand guidelines. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else from the audience? Yeah. Bobby, yes. Bobby. Yeah. Bobby. Hello, um, I'm Bobby Mbakar from CNS and my question is uh, uh, to Dr. Marike. Dr. Marike, uh, um, you know, NCDs, as we all know, interact with the HIV as well as tuberculosis. Uh, maybe not a direct connection, I, uh, malaria, please correct me. Uh, so, uh, and there are so many successful examples of integrating tobacco cessation, for example, in, in TB dots clinics or, or you know, at a very basic level with uh, some successes like 60% cessation rate, etc. So, um, and as a, as a global fund, I would like to really ask you, like, uh, are you thinking of strategically investing in NCDs because they cross cut, they affect people living with HIV, or uh, they are living longer, uh, HIV associated and non-associated NCDs, as well as tuberculosis, uh, as, as global fund funds uh, TB, HIV, malaria globally in helping save lives. And second question is refers to your uh, comment on the political commitment. I think there are three, or maybe I'm wrong, or more UN high-level meetings on non-communicable diseases, which is really historic. Uh, there is no other health issue on which probably so many UN HLMs have happened. Uh, so, uh, uh, so how? What more needs to be done to really translate that political commitment? Like, for example, I, I'm more involved with tuberculosis and HIV. And when uh, a UN high-level meeting on tuberculosis happened last September, we were so, so hopeful. And we are, um, and it did result in a political declaration and things are going forward on latent tuberculosis and many other action points. Uh, but when you look on NCDs, they had, uh, I think, three or more probably. So in terms of political commitment, how, what more can be done? be done to uh, uh, you know, accelerate progress on NCDs, but also, uh, as Dr. Tripti Gilada said, on integration between uh, the policy program and action level on NCDs and TPHIV. Thank you. Um, first question on the global fund is, um, we're a funding agency, we don't make policies. 
And uh, tobacco control is a very obvious one, which is important in HIV programs and in TB programs and in health more broadly. So if countries have support to stop smoking uh, as part of the programs, it certainly can be part of it. But we do not enforce it. We do not prescribe what countries should fund. Um, but absolutely. Um, on the second one, um, it's a really difficult one. And I feel, um, just as it happened this morning, I had um, a conversation with a group who's trying to set up a trust fund for NCDs. Mm -hmm. And um, what I was quite surprised, there's not a clear focus, because the NCD agenda is uh, a very broad agenda. So my first question was like, can you explain me a little bit what the focus of such mm -hmm. a trust fund would be because the NCDs, it goes from simple things like hypertension and diabetes to cardiovascular surgery to advanced cancer yeah. treatments. And they didn't really have a question to that, an answer to that. And, and then you see that also the NCD community is quite fragmented. You have the cancer community, you have the cardiovascular community, you have the, uh, the, the, um, sort of the, 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 the health and nutrition community. Yeah. I don't think that um, there's a compelling narrative Mm -hmm. Like, um, what's your focus? Is it all NCDs? To some extent, the mm -hmm. um, the increase in number of NCDs, also the success of us beating childhood illness, infectious diseases, and people live longer, yeah. and they get old enough to get NCDs. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, do we then focus on premature mortality um, and accept that people have to die at some mm -hmm. stage or something? Yeah. And uh, I felt it was still not... A, a real clarity. And uh, if I draw the parallel to when the Global Fund was created, it was a very clear narrative. There was uh, so many million people were dying, treatments were not uh, getting out there. So the narrative was very clear, which made it much easier to get a political attention and, um, and the funding. And so I think that at least I felt after this, it's really important, uh, really need to um, raise awareness. But also there should be much more focus because the disadvantage sometimes of being very comprehensive is that it covers everything mm -hmm. and it's really unclear what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So just some of my personal reflections. Yeah. Dr. Gilada would like to add. I think uh, uh, at the end I would like to tell we should concentrate on four points. When we came in medical profession, <coughs> counseling was a minuscule mm -hmm. part. We used to think counseling means education. We never thought counseling is interaction, understanding patient. And HIV has taught us a great deal what is the importance of counseling. But as soon as ART came, again people are forgetting counseling. So counseling is not only for reassuring patient that there is no medicine, but you can live like this way, this way. But now medicine has come, there is no need of counseling. So counseling, there is no holiday. Secondly, in the first visit, try to extract maximum possible commitment from the patient. If you miss first visit, you mm. cannot do much uh, mm. subsequent visit. So therefore, in our practice, we spend more than one hour per patient in the first visit. Why extraction of commitment is important that time? If they have some habit of say, smoking or tobacco or chewing or alcohol and they got HIV. Mm. So whatever medicines are come, everything has come, HIV is shock for them. Yeah. So in case that shock, tell them, okay, now you have this problem. Are you going to stop all these things which mm. are in your hand? Something which is in our hand will do, something which is in ART they will do, but what you are going to do from your side. Thirdly, adherence, asking patient that because uh, we in India say patient go in air as soon as they start feeling better, whether it is a TB or HIV or any disease, as soon as they start feeling better they go in air and then they, their lifestyle again go to a wire and they will forget taking medicine, adherence. And fourth most important is reassuring patient that I'm available anytime, anywhere. I'm in Mexico, but I'm available on WhatsApp. Mm. Use technology. Now, another important thing, what we have learned in our practice is, uh, because HIV has a stigma and discrimination, that is advantage for us, because patient will explain everything to us, mm. whether he has a cardiology problem, STD problem, so a skin problem, or a hypertension problem. But when they go to cardiologist, they will not tell that they have HIV. Mm. So basically, even though all doctors are equal in their profession, they are important. But we know everything about patient because patient opens everything to us. And therefore, we tell patient that wherever you have problem, go there, but keep us in loop. Mm. 
tell us what you are doing, what medicine you are taking. At least we can tell you drug drug interaction because he is not going to tell them he is on such and such ERT and uh, what medicine he is going to take, they will have interaction. So these things we have learned over the years and I think that they are going to be helpful to reduce NCDs in a great day. Yes. There is, one, there is one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, one big area of NCDs that we all forget is mental health and depression. Yeah. Yeah. And with aging, they are, they are financially deprived, they are emotionally deprived, they have lost their spouses or their loved ones, kids aren't looking after them and I think they need those extra 5 or 10 minutes in every visit mm. to get that mental stress away. Yes, question from uh, James, Dr. James. Yeah, I'm James Abuja Ken from UNT Dallas. Uh, thanks a lot for a good presentation. Um, my question is, uh, what would you propose as uh, effective strategies to promote a better understanding of the intersectionality between HIV and NCDs? Because there's more advocacy on the side of the HIV side than NCDs. So what can we do? to promote a better understanding using advocacy in order to promote a better collaborative action on both. You see, as a program, uh, WHO, UNAIDS, Global Health, governments or any departments, they are more interested in public health. Mm -hmm. Public health where uh, things are going to communicable, uh, like communicable diseases. So they would like to arrest communicable diseases as soon as possible. When you talk about NCD, it is not communicable. So it is only for that person, personal mm. problem is there. So we will not expect that there will be huge importance given to NCDs from every angle. Uh, let us be very frank. Let us uh, be practical. That we can't expect that everything will be done by all these big agencies in either uh, mm. uh, city level or uh, state level or country level or global level. So when NCDs or such issues come which are of personal importance to the person, we need to get commitment from there. We need to ask them to do lifestyle modification and we need to, as a physician, see what best we can do to alter medications. Mm. Uh, this there we will not expect that a lot of big thing will be done from global or uh, national programs and organizations. Yes, Dr. Marike, you would like yeah, to add? No, sorry if I'm wrong. No, 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 no I, I totally agree and, mm. um, and the evidence is very clear. And so for me, it is also, it's a lot about just using the evidence to yeah. show because as you see, you see as you're treating patients and follow patients for a long time, that HIV is not the only condition they are facing. They face many other conditions. As a doctor, you look at all the other conditions. And um, I think I remember, I'm from the Netherlands. I remember years ago, many years ago, that uh, AIDS uh, physicians, they were talking about uh, sort of, just like the, as people were getting older and longer in treatment about all the cardiovascular uh, mm -hmm. issues they were facing. And that means that you have to look at the patient as a person. And um, yes, you can, the governments can um, issue guidance, WHO mm -hmm. can issue guidance, but at the end of the day, it's also just the, the personal responsibility of the treating position to look at the person as a person. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Tripti, you want to add something? Add, add, add something to this discussion about advocacy for uh, <coughs> NCDs and HIV. Uh, I don't think there will be a lot of advocacy for NCDs. I mean, NCDs is not just a HIV problem, it's like an aging problem. Yeah. 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 So as our population gets older, I think it's like we have to just treat NCDs as they come along. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can, we can definitely use the opportunity, like I said, for the HIV positive individuals because they are in healthcare. But there is not going to be something very special about NCDs. I mean, yeah. we'll have to use what is existing. Yeah. Dr. Bob, uh, yeah, Bobby, just, you just a very quick question. I know we are running out of time. Uh, one is to Dr. Gilada. Dr. Gilada was also on the World No Tobacco Day webinar. So, uh, sir, you shared that, and I think it is very relevant. Dr. Gilada is not only about, has been among the first doctors who began HIV care in India, but he has uh, ensured that all HIV conferences do not have any, uh, you know, uh, they have a no tobacco, no alcohol policy. 
Sir, it is very important because global health community now is seeing the linkages between HIV, alcohol, and non-communicable diseases and general health well-being. I think it will be really uh, good for you to share uh, what inspired you. It will be very popular. ICASA 2019 takes some messages here. And Dr. Tripti, a very good question to you. Uh, is that, uh, you know, it's really good that if, if physici HIV physicians uh, t take care of, you know, of our NCD signs and symptoms. Uh, but in public health settings, is it, um, is it like going to happen? Is it pragmatic or is it possible? Thank you. Uh, I think it's definitely possible. You know, um, everyone, I mean, the caregivers in most countries are at least basic MBBS trained doctors. And blood pressure, diabetes, diagnosing that is not that difficult. I mean, they can always be referred to the relevant specialty once it's diagnosed. But the main thing is diagnosing it. I think where we are missing is diagnosis. And I think once the patients are told that they have a heart disease or they have blood pressure, they are responsible enough to take at least that one step forward and going to the physician. Uh, your, your question about tobacco and alcohol at conferences is uh, something we learned from our patients. When I was asking one of the <coughs> patients, why you continue smoking? He said, why government is producing tobacco? Why yeah. government is producing? Government should stop production of tobacco. Government should pro stop production of uh, cigarettes and beads. <laughs> But uh, the governments yeah. have their own compulsion. They are their vote bank, mm -hmm. their taxes, what they recover from that. They don't want to forego that. Those governments which have sta uh, start, uh, started uh, anti-tobacco or anti-alcohol policy, uh, they face a lot of problem in our country. So mm -hmm. those issues are there. But what we thought, we are number one from medical profession. So if we want to have other people to emulate us, we should have some example by ourselves. Number two, whether we do a conference or we run an organization, we collect money from people and run. It is not fair to spend that money in alcohol or tobacco or some certain things which are not required. Uh, it is better to spend that money on giving good food, good snacks, uh, good uh, cultural program because you are tired after the whole day, do a good program. And when we started, people called us mad. They said, how can medical conference run without alcohol? Mm. So what we learn. I was traveling once from uh, Mumbai to another uh, Delhi to another place and at that place there was a one CME organized and one very senior physician than me, about 15-20 years older, older than me, who just died two years back. We were traveling together. When we reached there, at a designated time, we, we doctor who should be punctual, we reached there, there were five people for the program. When the senior most physician started talking, by the end of the, his talk, there were seven, eight people. When I ended my talk, there were 15 people. But when we came out, there were 50 people outside taking alcohol. So what we talked to the pharma company, they said, no, sir, we said, we, no, no, please come for, uh, uh, what do you call, gala dinner or alcohol or uh, cocktail. <laughs> and there's also lecture of Dr. Gilada. <laughs> so I told that senior uh, uh, physician of, uh, who was my mentor also, that henceforth we stop going to places where they are inviting us to just to have, have their things are clear. There's basically alcohol party. We should not go to such places. Now today, Medical Council of India, Indian Medical Association, all government authorities, or WHO bodies, they are now making it compulsory, no alcohol, no tobacco. So it takes time, but it took almost 20 years for us to reach that level. Thank you. We have another question. Yeah. 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 It's just a comment. I'm taking that a tackling a NDC is very, very important yeah. that uh, we should also take into consideration tax shifting. Yeah. Because if you are not shifting tax, the doctor cannot do everything. That's very, very important. But I don't see too much tax shifting in this conference here. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking that we have to put it back on ICASA, you know, so that we can emphasize more on that. Tax is really key if really you want to address NDC in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Luke. Uh, thank you. You want to? No, just uh, just one comment and listening. And this is not in my role as global fund, but more personally, um, because we talk a lot about treating NCDs. But the most important part is prevention. And yes, yeah. um, because by the time you get to um, have all these problems, you're too late, and you mm -hmm. get into complex, lifelong, expensive treatments. Yeah. Prevention is very key, and I think that's where, Those if it's about raising awareness and uh, advocacy, I think this is about prevention, prevention. healthy lifestyles, which yeah. is not an easy one. Um, I talked about the stocks, the, the taxes on uh, sugar, t uh, tobacco, and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Those are things that uh, will be politically really difficult because there's strong economic incentives and powers in country that will stop it. 
but that will make it easier to have healthy lifestyles and uh, it will generate yeah. extra funding. Yeah. I've always said if I would ever be the Minister of Health of mm -hmm. the Netherlands, which I will never be, the yeah. first thing would be to tax unhealthy food mm -hmm. and to subsidize the healthy foods. Yeah, when good. my children left <laughs> great. When, when my children left home and had to sort of um, get by on, on a low student budget, they were complaining how expensive healthy food was mm -hmm. and how easy it was. You re yeah. really have to make an effort to eat healthy yeah. and the it's junk expensive. food and it's, the it's cheap food, cheap. Uh, the unhealthy food is super cheap, very easy and I think that's where we can have most attraction. Yeah. So that's a great message, uh, Dr. Marike and uh, thank, thanks to the panelists and thanks to the audience yeah, for the session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.